So joining us now is David Schoen. He was a lawyer for former President Trump during his second impeachment trial, and Schoen is now representing Steve Bannon in his contempt of Congress case. Counselor, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You've got experience representing Donald Trump, so I'm curious, have you been approached to work on this case, the classified documents case? Uh, well, I, I don't want to go into too many details, but I, I was approached uh, a couple months ago uh, to about being a liaison with the Justice Department. It wasn't for me. It doesn't suit my skill set. Um, I wasn't particularly interested in that. Um, but, uh, you know, I certainly know Evan Corcoran quite well, and he was hired to be my local counsel in the Bannon case. So I got to know him through that. I didn't know him beforehand, but uh, it strikes me as a guy who's as honest as the day is long. Um, and I'm sure he's been very diligent with this, so we'll see how it plays so out. So a couple months ago, that's interesting. So this is something that they've been dealing with in a pretty serious way for at least a few months, it sounds like what you're saying. I think that's right. I mean, you know, this, the issue's been out there in the media um, that the Justice Department was looking into this and so on, so uh, I'm sure they took it seriously. Um, it just wasn't for me, but... Why not? Uh, it's not my, not, not my skill set to sift through boxes and um, sort of liaison with the Justice Department. I'm hired generally when a case is going to trial or appeal to argue the case and to cross-examine witnesses. So that's, uh, that's my skill set, at least. Um, Evan Corcoran is someone who has worked with you in the Steve Bannon case. He is someone you recommended. You think he's a good attorney. The Washington Post published a story that suggested that Donald Trump's having a hard time finding enough or the right lawyers to represent him here. Is that something you see is happening in this case? I hope not, and I wouldn't think so. Let me, let me say from my experience, I, you know, I come from a very different background. A 37 years civil rights lawyer, criminal defense lawyer. I represent the ACLU and all of their litigation in Alabama for 20 years. I was approached to, out of the blue on this thing. I considered it a great honor to represent Donald Trump. And I saw at the time a media pieces saying he was having a hard time getting lawyers. I had some of the greatest lawyers in the country willing to help me prepare for the impeachment. But there are some people who at that time had been around President Trump giving advice and vetting lawyers and wanting to insinuate themselves into the situation, who I think gave bad advice. And so in this case, they nixed some of these people because they hadn't been vetted by them and so on, and sort of making themselves uh, too self-important. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a great honor for anyone to represent President Trump, any former president or president of the United States. The issues are fascinating in the case, and... Uh, that, that's my take on it. I, I think anyone would be honored, quite frankly. Is he an easy guy to work for? He's been incredibly gracious to me on every opportunity we've ever spoken. I, I read the reports in the media. And again, you know, I didn't know any of these folks before I got involved. Mm -hmm. Every time I've spoken to him, he's been incredibly gracious and complimentary. And I very much appreciate that. Let me ask you about some of the specific issues at hand today. For instance, this afternoon, there will be an argument before a judge in Florida about whether to release the affidavit that argued for the search warrant of the Mar-a-Lago residence. Now, Donald Trump has publicly said he wants the release. You and I both know that's very different than having your lawyers argue before a judge that it should be released. What would your legal advice be to Donald Trump on the issue of releasing the affidavit be? Well, again, you know, none of us really knows the underlying facts. I think, though, that Donald Trump has been very, uh, very clear in saying he wants transparency here. I think, uh, speaking with the American people to the extent I can, as an American citizen, I want to know what's in there. You know, we've got a history here, unfortunately, a bit of a checkered history between the Mueller investigation, the FISA warrants, and all of that business. I think the country depends on information. Mm -hmm. We want to know what's in there. What would the risks be for a possible defendant? What would the risks be for Donald Trump in making this public be? Well, the risks would be that, you know, uh, information, that negative information comes in, but that's going to have to come in one way or another one day. And I think you're better off testing it now. Uh, again, information is the key. That's your business, you know, uh, which you do very well. And uh, I think when it's out there, then we'll hear both sides of the argument. And some of the facts, alleged facts in the affidavit can be challenged publicly uh, from, with people who know the underlying facts. That's what's so important, I think. Rumor doesn't help anyone. The country's very divided now. Everybody needs to know what happened, I think. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, Donald, we have reporting, and I think you just heard it from our CNN reporter, Gabby Orr, who said some people within Trump war were arguing for Donald Trump to release the surveillance footage of the FBI searching Mar-a-Lago. That's a political decision right there with actually no legal implications, really, because it's Trump's to release if he wants to. Would you suggest he also release the surveillance footage that had been subpoenaed by the FBI 
that there are reports that investigators were alarmed by what they saw. Why not release that footage? Well, again, you know, I'm in favor of full disclosure of everything, but there are always issues regarding privilege and uh, other factors I'm certainly not aware of enough to be able to say to you today, this should be released or that should be released. I can only tell you my general view is information is important, and if it's, a public inf if it's information that's of public interest, it should be made uh, publicly exposed, in my now, view. You say you've represented all kinds of clients, worked for the ACLU in Alabama. I'm sure you've represented all kinds of clients. As a legal matter, is there any difference in the standing between, you know, Citizen Joe and a former president of the United States, do they have the same rights and privileges? Yeah, I think there are a number of factors that are important. You know, I, I don't know if you saw, Alan Dershowitz wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal this week about, you know, what aboutism. People sort of mock it and all that. But I think the key here, and this was part of his article, the key here is when we have the attorney general saying this reflects the equal application of the law, same thing he said in the Bannon case, it, it really doesn't. Um, it, it, we haven't treated everyone in similar, similarly situated the same. I think that especially when it comes to a public figure like the president of the United States or former president of the United States, there are a number of factors that have to be considered. You know, people get upset when they say, oh, there could be a revolution, it could be a civil war and so on. You have to take into account public sentiment. Right now, there's a great deal, mm -hmm. half of the nation doesn't trust the government, our government. We have to get past that. We have to, but again, this is, I think, a function of transparency to some degree, but there have been some very bad moves. You know, you have in the Justice Department now, uh, number two in charge, who's an Andrew Weissman acolyte, this Lisa Monaco. People don't know what's driving, what's driving uh, the forces that are going on. I can tell you in the Bannon case, they said it was the equal application of the law. It absolutely was not. Well, let me just say this. I, I, yeah. As you well know, there was a judge in Florida who did have to sign off on this application for a search warrant and did find that there was probable cause to search this resident. I guess the specific question I'm asking you is, does a former president have any greater right than you do to hang on to documents that are marked classified or top secret or sensitive compartmented information? Well, first of all, you know, he has greater rights to access to those documents originally than the average person. He's also in a position to analyze whether documents are classified and in a position through the proper procedures to declassify them. So that's different he, from... He has no right to declassify them as a former president, correct? That's correct. That's correct. And, and, and in terms of access, accessing them, he has a perfectly good right to access them if they are in possession of the proper authorities, which would be the National Archives, correct? I think that's right. Now, remember, under all of these statutes that apply, there is a mens rea element, either knowingly, intentionally, or willfully, depending... I'm so glad you brought that up, because the New York <laughs> Times uh, reports that in discussions about the former documents, and this came out in the reporting of Pat Cipollone, former White House counsel, and Pat Philbin, his deputy, talking to investigators as part of this investigation, the former president had been asked to return some of these documents. He'd been pushed to return some of these documents by his representatives. And the former president repeated the resisted entreaties from advisors. He said, quote, it's not theirs, it's mine. Several advisors say Mr. Trump told them. It's not theirs, it's mine. By definition, does that not suggest he knew he had these? Uh, it may suggest he knew he had certain documents. It doesn't mean he had a guilty uh, state of mind. I'm, I, I, to be perfectly clear, I don't believe Donald Trump thought he did anything wrong with any of these documents at any time. Now, was he naive? Did other people pack up documents? Did he get bad advice? I don't know. I don't think we know enough about those facts. I don't believe for a second Donald Trump intentionally, knowingly, willfully would have done anything wrong with any of these documents. That's my personal view. And by the way, Maggie Haberman's a friend of mine, and I'm sure she did an excellent job reporting, but that's my view. Again, he doesn't think he did anything wrong is different than knowing he had the documents and had been told he wasn't supposed to have had them, correct? Uh -huh. I hear, I hear, yeah. And so with respect to the documents at issue in that piece you just, you just, uh, you know, showed the excerpt from, it would seem as to those documents, they were talking about documents, he knew he had certain documents. But I'm always wary when I see, you know, excerpts. I don't know the full conversation. I understand, but if you he know. had been told, if he, and you said Maggie Haber is a friend and a great reporter, right. let's, and she's not, she's just telling us what, she, of course. what the reporting is there. But of course. if Donald Trump admitted he knew he had the documents, which that statement seems to suggest, and had he been told it was wrong to have them, does that not create the mental state which could provide for some culpability? 
No. The, the advice that he was wrong to have had them could be mistaken advice. Um, and it, it still really doesn't go directly to Donald, to Donald Trump. Someone else reporting what they understood Donald Trump to have said with respect to documents. There are all kinds of issues in there. What documents are we talking about? Did he have some documents in mind that the other person didn't have in mind? Um, was it advice proper that he got? And so on. Again, I, I say I don't believe he intentionally, knowingly, willfully would have done anything wrong with any documents. I, I, I know him, and that's, that's my candid take on it.